Tonight on Coach's Corner, it's a man that has done it all. Sports agent Lee Steinberg stops by to discuss his career, the athletes he represents, his view on sports, the movie Jerry Maguire, and much more. I'm Paul Higgins, this is Coach's Corner, and it all starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Paul Higgins and welcome once again to Coach's Corner on location at the shops at Mission Viejo. Special guest joining me today and it's Lee Steinberg. As you can tell on the opening of the show, Lee has had an incredible career and he continues that today. And Lee, I welcome you to Coach's Corner and, and I showed you my questions and these are my questions, Lee. We're just going to run the gamut of sports. A white piece of paper. Uh, I'm not sure I can <laughs> handle them. Uh, that paper looks pretty daunting. <laughs> you, you know, I, I met you. I don't know if you remember, but I remember because I was pretty uh, amazed at meeting you and in, in early on in my career. But when I met you, you were actually signing Kerry Collins, and and you had him in in your office. And and I went over there and I interviewed you. And then Kerry came in. And one thing I remember about Kerry, what a great guy. I'm just like, what a great person to have. You have had so many great people, but I want to take you back because, um, of course, on the internet, you get to read about stuff that you've done, Wikipedia and your history, but what, what really impressed me the most, going back to high school, you were the student body president. In college, you were basically the student body president, created your own political you know, agenda, and you were so influential then and, and I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, was it Steve Barkowski was your first client? Yes. Was that by accident, or did that kind of just, you know, well, was Paul, it planned? it really wasn't sports law then. Yeah. Uh, a team could tell an agent, we don't talk to players. So I was living in the dorms at Berkeley, working my way through law school, and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm, and one of them was Steve Barkowski. Well, I traveled for a year after law school, when I got back, I was choosing between jobs. Barkowski had been the very first player picked in the first round of the NFL draft. Right. He was a, picked by the Falcons, and there was a World Football League competing with That's the right. NFL. Yeah. And uh, there I was, brimming with legal experience, never having <laughs> represented anyone. So I had the, we got the largest rookie contract in NFL history. It eclipsed Joe Namath and O.J. Simpson, who were the previous standard bearers. So we get back to Atlanta. It's the night before the signing. And as we arrive at the airport, there are Klieg lights flashing in the sky, a huge crowds pressed up against the police line. And the first thing we hear is, we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney have just arrived at the oh Atlanta airport. We switch you live for an in-depth interview. And it was really then I saw the idol worship and veneration that athletes are held in communities across the country, how they're the movie stars and the celebrities. And that's how I thought I could combine a career with, with underlying values and get athletes to retrace their roots to the high school community that helped shape them, the collegiate community and the professional community, and set up programs that would enhance the quality of life. Right. 120 high school scholarship funds at the collegiate level at uh, players like Eric Karros and Troy Aikman endowed a full scholarship at uh, UCLA or Steve Young at uh, BYU. Uh, Kerry Collins did that same thing at Penn State. Oh, did he really? And it's a way of saying this institution helped shape me. I'm going to put roots down here. I'm going to retrace these roots. At the pro level, we challenged athletes to find something in their own life they'd like to tackle and put together a foundation uh, that had the leading business people, political figures, and community leaders on uh, in each of those cities. So right, right. it could be work done with his homes for the holidays where he paid the down payment so single mothers could move into the first home they'd ever own, and then we had Home Depot outfitted. or. Years ago, the very first program was Rolf Nurska's Kicks for Critters oh, down yeah. in San Diego, yeah, yeah, yeah. where we raised millions of dollars for the Fund for Endangered Species at yeah. the San Diego Zoo with a poster pledge card program. But um, these athletes have a powerful ability to serve as role models. Yeah. So 
That's true. When I had Lennox Lewis, the heavyweight champion, we had him cut a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women. And that could do more to trigger attitudes towards domestic uh, violence than a hundred authority absolutely. figures. What did your parents do? What's My father was a high school uh, principal. That's what I thought. Um, but he, his passion was human relations, so right. he sat on the Los Angeles City Human Relations Commission. And he really gave me two core values. One was to treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was try to be someone who changed the world for the better by helping people who couldn't help themselves. Right. So that was all. I just sort of fell into business. Well, you know, it's it's one of those things where, and I know you've, I'm going to ask you some questions that you've answered thousands of times, so apologize for that. Uh, I always like to hear answers one on one, but um, you have you have done so many positive things, you know, outside of sports. Uh, I was just on PBS, you know, about two or three weeks ago. I guess time flies. It could have been longer. You were a guest on that show with Ed Arnold, but it wasn't about sports. Tell us about that. What that was, because it's a foundation and another cause. Well, they. Uh were kind enough to give me the humanitarian or friend of the planet, well, an award like that <laughs> from the Wyland Foundation. He's got so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> from, from the Wyland Foundation, who's the artist Wyland, who does yep. the big murals. And he's got an education program that helps um, bring the arts and the environment to kids across the country. So they run a whole variety of uh, programs. but. If you're going to talk to athletes about living in a community and making a difference, I always thought it was important. So, you know, when I loved films, I funded the Newport Beach Film Festival for years, or the Spirit Run so we could help the kids um, in uh, grammar school, or um, the Human Relations uh, Commission here in Orange County. We did a program where we took, called Steinberg Leadership, where we took kids from different ethnic backgrounds, got them together to, so they could interact um, and, and treasure their uh, cultural differences, not be afraid. You've done a lot, and you know, I've only asked them two questions, and we're already done with the first segment. <laughs> Could be an hour show. We'll be back with more with Lee Steinberg right here on Coach's Corner at the shops of Mission Viejo. Mission Basilica School, located in historic San Juan Capistrano, is a blue ribbon school focused not only on quality education, but spiritual enlightenment, creating a learning environment that's second to none. I love the feel of the school and, and what it brings. They're wonderful kids, have great family lives. They are brothers and sisters once they reach the campus. A blue ribbon school for academic excellence, located on the beautiful grounds of Mission San Juan Capistrano. Welcome to the shops at Mission Viejo, proudly serving South Orange County. With over 150 stores and restaurants, the shops at Mission Viejo is South Orange County's premier shopping destination. The shops at Mission Viejo offer more choices, where you will find great retailers such as Nordstrom, Microsoft, Frederick Rubel Jewelers, and William Sonoma. Hungry, the Cheesecake Factory is a great destination. The shops at Mission Viejo offer a positive community atmosphere, a gathering place among friends and family, a place for children to meet and play, a place to relax at your own leisure. We welcome you to the shops at Mission Viejo and look forward to you visiting us soon. Hello everybody, welcome back to this edition of Coach's Corner. Again, we're on location at the shops of Mission Viejo. Throughout the course of the show, you'll see an email address on there to Ty. If you've got a show idea in mind or if you want to be a guest, if you've got an idea, just email Ty. We'll get back to you and maybe get you on the board and be sitting along the side the likes of Lee Steinberg joining me. And, and Lee, you know, it, it, I, I still watch it when it comes on HBO, and, and I know you, we've talked about this in the past, but the movie Jerry Maguire or Tom Cruise, you were in the movie, you know, based on pretty much who you were and what you did. Um, how has that changed? Has, has that, has that, if that movie was made today, would it be much different than it was back when it was made? I don't think so. The same competitiveness in the agency business, the same conflict between trying to make a difference in the world and, and being competitive, all those issues are still uh, the same. 
uh, the Jerry Maguire character struggles with it. The mission statement is sort of uh, my, my, after my yep. charitable and community uh, programs, but it's it's sort of his uh, arc. So the director Cameron Crowe called me up in 1993 and asked if he could follow me wherever I went, like a fly on the wall, so that he could be. Uh, uh, ensconced in the world of sports agentry. So he went to the draft with me in 93 where I drew Bledsoe pick first. He went to pro scouting day at SC. He went to um, the league meetings out in Palm Desert. He came to a lot of games with me, Super Bowl party, and then just sat in the office for a long period of time. And then he wrote the script and then I had to work uh, to vet it, so the willing suspension of disbelief that's going to hold you in a film and not think it's a spoof didn't get broken. And then I worked with the actors. I took Cuba Gooding Jr. with me down to. Pretty good athlete. <laughs> yeah. He was great, and and um, I went with him down to um, Arizona and I made him pretend he was a wide receiver for a week. I actually had to show the quarterback Jerry O'Connell had to throw the ball because he, he had gone to uh, NYU. Oh my goodness. And, uh, um, and then they came to my office and took um, pictures out the window and they oh. took all my awards and put Jerry Maguire's name <laughs> in it. They, they took my pictures and Tom Cruise's head, you know, got <laughs> superimposed. And uh, so that, that was interesting. And, and, and Cameron, I loved and was, yeah. When I worked on any given Sunday next, uh, uh, Oliver Stone was a little different. <laughs> oh yeah, much different, right? You know, you, I read a blog that you that you have, and, and it's great that you're writing and you're continuing to contribute your words of wisdom, but I have a total of five kids. Uh, four of them are boys, 12 to one years old. Should they play football, tackle football? I mean, you wrote a really riveting article about concussions and head injuries. Even back in 94 when you said, 94 there was a problem they didn't recognize they they recognized it but they didn't really tell anybody but it's been going on for since football was developed your thoughts about that i know we could talk a whole show about that but but a little sidebar question for you i i had two boys they both played high school football at corona del mar high school so i wasn't successful in my own family <laughs> football creates camaraderie teaches self uh, respect, it teaches self-discipline, it teaches courage under pressure, it's so valuable for so many reasons. Here's the problem, it's a contact sport and when you put two bodies in motion or have them hitting at the start of every play, it produces a low level concussive effect. Football denied this all the way through 1994 and I held these concussion conferences in Newport Beach and then I held them in Los Angeles because I didn't think it was enough to simply stack more dollars in the bank book and watch players go out. So what we discovered is that if you have three or more, there's an exponentially higher risk for ALS, Parkinson's, premature senility, elevated rates of depression, four times the rates of depression, uh, dementia, and something called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Here's the danger in high school. These brains are still developing, and it takes three to four times longer to recover, and they still need, as high schoolers, to use that brain to play. Um, if you just take the simple act of an offensive and defensive lineman hitting yep. together, low-level concussive event, you may have someone who plays high school, college, and later have 10,000 of these. And it's like 10,000 small car accidents, is that right? That's From exactly yeah. right. And so I've called it a ticking time bomb and an undiagnosed health epidemic. Um, the problem is everything we do to try to, to cure this, taking the blocking, uh, with the head out of uh, the equation or the tackling out of the equation um, or looking at playing surface or uh, having mandatory sit-out periods. Baseline testing is what every parent needs to have their child do now because it gives a cognitive level prior to the play. Then when the player gets hit, you've got a way of measuring and keep him out of play again until uh, he's asymptomatic at practice, excuse me, before practice, uh, at rest, exercise, yeah. pull, 
then at practice, and then he goes into a game. Junior Seau, uh, only got a minute left in this segment, so we'll carry this, this question. I'm going to have to have you back a couple times. <laughs> um, I'll ask you the question, I'll let you melt on it here for a second, um, because I, I don't want you to answer it, but maybe nod your head. Junior Seau shot himself in the chest as opposed to the head, and I'm guessing that uh, he probably knew that his brain was going to be opened up and they were going to find exactly that he had brain damage. So I want to talk to you about that and get your opinion because you did mention that in your article. So much to talk about. We're not going to get to it all tonight. Lee Steinberg on this edition of Coach's Point. Welcome to the shops at Mission Viejo, proudly serving South Orange County. With over 150 stores and restaurants, the shops at Mission Viejo is South Orange County's premier shopping destination. The shops at Mission Viejo offer more choices, where you will find great retailers such as Nordstrom, Microsoft, Frederick Rubel Jewelers, and William Sonoma. Hungry, the Cheesecake Factory is a great destination. The shops at Mission Viejo offer a positive community atmosphere, a gathering place among friends and family, a place for children to meet and play, a place to relax at your own leisure. We welcome you to the shops at Mission Viejo and look forward to you visiting us soon. Mission Basilica School is a Catholic parochial school with single grade classrooms from pre-kindergarten through eighth grade. We have absolutely the best to offer in education. We don't just educate the child academically, they are nurtured spiritually, they are guided through their spiritual journey, they are loved, every being of them. A Blue Ribbon School for Academic Excellence, located on the beautiful grounds of Mission San Juan Capistrano, Mission Basilica School. So much to talk about on this edition of Coach's Corner, and before the break I was talking to Lee about Junior Seau, and of course so many Charger fans, but uh, Lee, you and I didn't talk about this at the break for a reason, I, I wanted to get your honest answer. Do you think that the way he committed suicide was for a reason, that he knew there might be a possibility that he did have brain damage because of football and want to tell a story? Obviously, no one can go into another person's brain post-mortem, but clearly he knew that this was going to happen. There have been a series of chronic traumatic encephalopathy cases, and what happens is a player who has too many hits starts to get depressed. They, they don't know how to deal with post-career. They get, they lose jobs. They alienate themselves from their family. And ultimately, in the case of Dave Duerson and others, they shoot themselves. Junior Seau knew because the whole issue of these lawsuits is huge. Um, I represented him for a couple years uh, mid-career and um, very bright. He, he, he knew exactly what he was doing, my guess. Your thoughts, uh, one word answer to this. Will professional football survive? Yes. Okay, and is it because of there's so much money, so much popularity that people just might look the other way? First of all, you've never had a sport in my lifetime dominate American viewing patterns this way. Uh, a number of weeks during the season, out of 90 Nielsen rated shows, the top five NCIS to an all, half men, all those other shows. Football in America, a nighttime pregame show, was third rated. Um, they <laughs> estimated that some weekends 183 million people watched. And that's to say nothing of fan attendance and fantasy leagues and betting and every other thing yeah. you could think of. This country is NFL crazy. It's <laughs> lapped every other sport. Yeah. You're, you, you have. Um negotiated, and I, I read this, and you, you corrected me if I'm wrong on, on the reading, over $2 billion in contract negotiations. That's mind-boggling to me. What does a sports agent-to-be need to know today? Do they have to be an attorney like you are? Do they have to know contract law? And if so, why? And your advice to these young men and women. To get licensed by the NFLPA or by Major League Baseball in football, there's a need for a postgraduate degree. Could be in anything. The question is, can you bring something value added to an athlete that he doesn't have? It's the ability to, to help him legally or financially or bring some skill set that he doesn't already have. It, 
it's not that law school prepares you inherently for all sorts of things. It's the degree has uh, credibility. The preparation they need is, first of all, to have a true passion for players. And second of all, a work ethic that's off the charts. These are hyper-competitive fields. So the young guy who, who thinks about how to do a resume that someone mocked up a Sports Illustrated cover with himself on the cover, sent it to us. The whole issue ha was revolved around he and our firm. That's novel. You need to have ex something extra to get into sports, and then a monomaniacal work uh, ethic, and uh, especially in one's 20s, the ability to sort of put aside other things and be able to focus. That's not my requirement. It's the free enterprises yeah. requirement. Otherwise, you'll get rolled. You've got to be a people person, right? You're a people person. You've got to be able to. Listening skills are really a critical, yeah. Paul. It's, people think it's all about persuasion. I need to get an athlete to list their values, how they feel about short-term economic gain, long-term economic security, family, yeah. um, profile, the ability to be a starter, being on a winning team. So part of it is peeling back the layers yeah. of the onion so that men who don't share very easily will tell you what their deepest anxieties and fears are and their greatest hopes and dreams. So it's not modular, it's person by person okay. getting into what is the right result for them. With that said, and I know we're winding down, but um, you've had so many great clients and continue to have so many great relationships and clients. If you were to pick two, I know that for some reason, Troy Aikman pops out in my mind. Still today, he's amazing. Um, You've had so many, but do you pick up two of the top of all of them, or can you? Warren Moon and I went through 23 years um, in football. He played 23 yeah, years amazing. in Canada in the National Football League. Um, and he was a representative great role model. He, he set up a high school scholarship fund. He set up a college scholarship fund. He had a Crescent Moon Foundation where hundreds of kids um, went back to school on his scholarships and I presented him at the Hall of Fame yeah, yeah. and then you know between Steve Young and, and Troy Aikman and uh, Rolf Bernerska and a whole series of I sort of love them all. You can't pick two. But, the, but well, at one point you know I've had 60 first round draft picks in football. And that's, the, that's unheard of. The very it's first. It's never going to happen again. The very he did it. first <laughs> pick in the draft eight times. There were weekends we had half the starting quarterback, so, uh, and now I'm ready to do it again. That's right. That's what's fascinating, and, and I'm excited. Can I ask you uh, your thoughts about youth sports? I, I'm a passion for getting kids off the couch. The video games, iPads, and all that, they are extremely addictive. Kids get roped up into it. How do we get these kids to continue to play sports starting at six years old up to 17? Your thoughts about that? Bye parenting correctly. I wrote a book on youth parenting that I haven't published yet. It's, it's how parents can nurture a sense of self-esteem and not crush it at a very early age. Get those kids to have fun, to participate, to not be <coughs> so hyper-focused on winning young that, that they lose it. There's plenty of time later to get that way. But sports teach so many fundamental values. Yeah. It's about teamwork, camaraderie. It's about setting a goal and, and, and working towards it. It's about the ability to think clearly under pressure. Right. Um, these are all life lessons that we want these kids to know. And the truth of the matter is, the more we learn as our generation ages, my generation, your generation. I'm not that far behind Eternally, you, eternally I got young. Makeup on, I know. <laughs> um, is that it's exercise and activity that's the key to longevity. Yeah. It's exercise that stops, you know, obesity and diabetes and aging in all sorts of ways. So you get those uh, young people started early. And once you get them into the experience, encourage them. Parents have to be careful not to put type A behavior onto their kids. I'll tell you a quick story. So my daughter, Katie, uh, lost with her soccer team in the playoffs. So she's out there crying. So I said, oh, Katie, I, I feel, you know, you, there'll be other seasons. She said, Dad, 
I'm not crying because we lost. I'm crying because I don't get to see my friends on the team as much. Wow. So be, wow. be careful about yeah. letting kids have their uh, uh, experiences without assuming it's all about right. you know being the star or winning. You know when a sign of a good interview is when, I'm not saying I'm doing a good interview, but I'm saying when you have a lot of questions left to, to ask. And I have a lot of questions left to ask, so we'll try to have Lee back again as uh, he continues to surge out there again and again. Amazing story. Lee Steinberg, um, Lee, there's so many more things I want to talk to you about. At one point, when I was in his office back in the day, interviewing him, and he was in the midst of round one draft picks and signing quarterbacks, I was going to ask him if he could represent me. Maybe one day I'll ask him that. <laughs> thanks so much for joining me. My you pleasure. did a fantastic job. You, Lee Steinberg, thanks so much for joining us. Right here on Coach's Corner for MVTV Channel 30. It's the best in the city, no doubt about it. We're doing something that nobody else is doing, and we're going to continue to do it. Thanks for watching. I'm Paul Higgins.